Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the praises to our King just rise among us. Let it
transpiring uh, where it's sort of been uh, like we did the first message and we had a snow week and then I got to do two messages together and then we were away last week so now this is here so it takes a little while to get through this uh, but it's I truly believe as we started off this year that this is where God wants us to go to deal with this, this blessed life that uh, as it started out each week I said this about this you know we could choose to try to live our life based on love. But the problem, what's the problem with love? Love doesn't have any guarantees. You have hits or misses with love. You know, uh, it, it just, it's just not there. Love is temporary. Love can't be counted on. And that's why I want to challenge you through this series as we start this year. Let's change the way that we're trying to live. And let's truly try to live blessed. Let's try to live a life that is truly blessed by God. Talk, stop trying to live by love and learn how to live blessed. And I have these two phrases behind me, those two statements I have behind me. I said, living blessed comes with guarantees. And, I know, and we've shown that in the Word, and I'll hit it briefly this morning. But later on, I'm going to hit a series of messages dealing with this next line is, you can live blessed even on bad days. That, see, that's the greatest thing about the blessed life. It doesn't matter what's going on in your life, you can still live blessed. And again, we'll get there. I don't want to get ahead of myself. But sometimes when these things start to come to my mind, I sort of want to jump and I gotta, I gotta stay in the thing that God has me to do with this. Uh, but we can live blessed even on bad days. And again, I'll remind you, it is God's desire to bless us. That's what when you read the first several chapters of Genesis, we read where from day one, God desired to bless mankind. He says, he, it literally says, He blessed them. So God desired to bless us. And then I brought out in the first mission, when we dealt with this, we, we dealt with this one portion of Scripture, Deuteronomy 28, verses 1 through 14. Now those list the blessings. Now from there on, I think it goes like to verse like 56 or 67, it lists curses after that. So verse 15 down, I mean, there's a ton of curses in there. I'm telling you, I'd rather be on the blessed side than... The curse side. Uh, but in those first 14 verses, there's two verses that, that talk about how God desires a blessing. It can summarize all those blessings. In verse 6, it says, wherever you go, whatever you do, you will be what? Blessed. And in verse, 20, in verse 8 or 28, it says, the Lord will what? Guarantee. The Lord will guarantee a blessing on everything you do. You will and will fill your storehouses with grain, the Lord your God will bless you in the land He has given you. And if you continue to the next verse, all of this is all transpires through obedience. In other words, I told you before, God's love is unconditional. There is nothing you can do to make Him love you more. There is nothing you can do to make Him love you less. Understand it. No matter, you can be the most vilest person there is, and guess what? God still loves you. You could be the best person there's ever been. You could be the closest person to live like Jesus Christ there has ever been that ever lived. But God does not love you any more than a person who's the Bible. Because His love is unconditional no matter who you are. Now, with that being said, His blessings are not. And I've shared that time and time again as we were going through these messages. Every time you see God declares a blessing, there's always something that, that goes along with it. It always deals with obeying something that He's he has said, listening to his voice. But God guarantees his blessing in every area of our life. But like I said, this can only come through a wholehearted obedience to him. I believe there are four ways that we must live in order to step into a blessed life. And we dealt with two of them already. We're going to deal with the third today. And I talked about, we talked about the shared life, the generous life. And now today we're going to deal with the sacrifice life. But again, what does bless mean? Blessed means one who has received a gift or favor from God. Divinely or supremely favored. We're not just talking about being happy. Because happiness is only temporary. We're talking about something that will last. Blessed is the opposite of cursed. One is favor and the other is punishment. So today we're going to look at the thought of living a sacrifice life. 
If you remember a while back ago, we read from Acts chapter 2, verses 41 through 47. And in this passage, we see a glimpse of the sacrifice life. In verses 44 and 45, this is what we're reading. It says, And all the believers met together in one place, shared everything they had, and sold their property and possessions, and shared the money with those in need. See, this new church was simply living out what Jesus taught. Imagine that. They just simply did what he said. But unfortunately, it seems like we have lost this concept in many churches today and among so many so-called, no quotation, Christians. It's truly about thinking about others. In an encounter with a rich young man, Jesus shows us the scope of the sacrifice that is expected from those who want to live a blessed life. Jesus says to disciples after talking to this young man, who was unwilling to sacrifice. I'm going to read you what he says to them. But this is the guy who came up and says, Master, what must I do? What good deed must I do to inherit eternal life? And of course, this is the guy when Jesus told him certain things. He says, I've kept all of those rules from my youth. Up. What else do I lack? And then Jesus told him, go sell everything you have and give to the poor. Come, follow me, and you shall have eternal life. Now again, that sounds like a radical statement, but think back to what, if you remember, think back to the opening video. What David Platt was describing. Remember, he says, we have to give up what? Everything. Everything. We have to give up our own desires, our own dreams, our own wants. We have to give up it all to follow him. It's truly about a life that's being committed and, and given to him. So he's talking to this rich and rural. I and mean, Jesus told us to this, this guy, he says, basically thought that's too much of a price. And then the disciples have a little conversation with him. And they say, Lord, we've given up stuff. And here's what Jesus says to the reply. In verse 29 in Matthew 19, I would suggest you go read the story of the rich young ruler found in this chapter. He says, everyone who has given up houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or property for my sake will receive a hundred times as much in return and will inherit eternal life. See, he's telling us when we truly are willing to give everything to him, he just pours it back out upon us. He just pours it back out upon us. But we have to get to a place where we're really, where we're willing to let go and truly trust God in what's happening. And I'll, I'll sort of touch that a little bit later on in the message. See, sacrifice, according to what we read here, looks like it's a foregone conclusion. If Jesus felt the need to make this statement, he must have come to the conclusion that our lives would be a life of sacrifice. But we're going to take a look at an account in the Old Testament today. It's found in 1 Kings chapter 17 and chapter 18. And we're going to learn a few things about the life of Elijah and what's going on here that, that teach us about the sacrifice life. Now in, in these two chapters, again, I'm not going to have them up there. There's, there's a portion of scripture later on from these chapters I'm going to have up there that we're going to deal with. But I'm not going to read all two chapters to you because we'll be here a little while reading that. But I do want to encourage you to read to read this. But what's actually going on there is that Elijah earlier declared that God was going to send no rain. There was going to be a drought in Israel. And it was all because that the king of Israel at the time was pretty weak. He was a pretty wicked king. So, so literally, Elijah declares God's judgment on him because there's not going to be any rain. And so, but before this happens, you know, of course it's all being led by God to do this. Elijah declares it, and then God tells him, I want you to go to a certain place, and when you go there, it's to buy this certain brook, just stay there, you can drink of the water there, and I'm going to command birds to bring you food. Now think about that. Think about that. Elijah already knows he's declaring this land is going to be trouble, and things are going to get, get scarce, and God basically says, don't worry about it, just go sit by this brook, you have water to drink, and I'm going to send birds to take you. Every day. Every day. Somehow, so way, God had these birds collect food to bring to Elijah to where he had food to eat. Now, just, I mean, God, I mean, the same way, children of Israel in the wilderness for 40 years, every day, God supplied them with food. Every day, he supplied them with water. Then, because the drought is going on, the brook eventually does dry up. And God says, I want you to go to the near side. I want you to go to the to, to temple of Zarephath. And, and there's a widow there prepared to take care of you. So Elijah goes there, and, and then there's a story that we'll touch that a little bit later on. He goes there, and then after a while, the, 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 the famine has now been about three years, 
And he goes and he approaches. He says, it's time for me to go meet with King Ahab and meet with Israel and finally have them make up their minds. Who's God? Is it Baal? Is Baal God or is the Lord God? Which one's God? Whichever one's God we need to worship. And this is where we sort of get into the account of where there's a showdown on Mount Carmel. Where Elijah, he, he tells the prophets of Baal there's 450 of one sect and 400 of the other sect of the prophets of Baal and the Asherah. And, and he says, you know, you sit there, you prepare a sacrifice, and you call out to Baal, and the God that answers by fire, let him be God. And, you know, so they started around 9 o'clock in the morning, and they're going... They're going until noontime, and finally Elijah, he's sort of, sort of saying, he's sort of had enough, and he starts to poke fun at them. He starts to sort of mess around with them and just sort of joke with them. Say, hey, you know, maybe you need to holler a little bit louder. Maybe, because you maybe need to wake Bell up. You know, he is a God. Maybe, maybe he's away on vacation. Maybe he's using the bathroom. And think about that. And he's, yeah, he's, he's telling them. I mean, that's what he told them. And, um, and so she keeps on going to finally gets near to where the evening sacrifice. And Elijah finally says, yeah, that's enough. You guys are stuck. You had your chance. He says, now... I'm going to do. So he goes and he he offers, he, he prepares the altar. He prepares it, he prepares it, he, he does it. As we do, he puts water over it. I'll get to some of that here in a little bit. And he prays about a prayer, depending on which version you look at, anywhere from like a 55 word prayer to a 60 some odd word prayer. And you know, these guys were going all day long. Nothing. He prays for something that may have taken less than a minute. And all of a sudden the Bible says, fire came down from heaven. Hit that sacrifice. It's already been watered. They were watering all of them. Hit that sacrifice. It literally, it consumed the sacrifice, consumed the wood, consumed the stones that the altar was made out of, and also sucked up all the water that was there. And I'll, I'll get to that here in a minute. But I sort of want to sort of just give you a background on what is going on here as we dive into this thing, talking about living a sacrifice. Like, you know, Pastor, you know, how is this talking about sacrifice? Well, the point number one is the one sort we start to get there first. Number one is this. Scarce equals sacrifice. As I was sharing that story with you, I want you to notice that Elijah does something with his sacrifice that the prophets of Baal do not. They both, they both set up an altar, they both put wood there, but they both uh, prepared the sacrifice and place an order, but Elijah goes a step farther. He offers water. He offers something that is very, very scarce at the time. Remember I told you, they're in a drought. It hasn't rained for three years. And water is very, very scarce. But what does he do? He's, he offers up this thing that's almost like liquid gold at the time. He offers up this water. In fact, he has them pour 12 Buckets of water over top this sacrifice. <coughs> he offered them something. He offered God something that was very, very scarce. And, and here's what I want you to understand. I want you to make, make sure you understand this. I think that some of us think we are sacrificing when we really are. Some of us are giving money as if we're sacrificing but money isn't scarce to you. Some of you are giving up time to act like you're sacrificing, but time isn't scarce to you because you have time to do whatever you want and then other things. See, there's a difference between a person who serves but doesn't lose anything versus a person who serves and has to make a choice of either this or that. See, Jesus talks about giving valuable items, sacred items, love items for His name's sake. But my question is, how many of us have really lost anything or given anything of true value to Jesus? We lose one and a half hours a week on Sunday, maybe two, and we act like <coughs> we've given Him so much. <coughs> We act like we're giving Him this great thing on a Sunday. But are we giving out of our abundance or out of our need? What if this walk with Christ cost you everything? We need to understand that Jesus flips the measuring stick on us and shows us that we must stop our lives by what cost us 
by not how much we get, but what we give away, what it costs us. When was the last time you followed Jesus so much that it hurt? See, too many of us are trying to follow him afar off, out of reach of the sacrifice necessary to get close. But if you're going to live a blessed life, you're going to have to get to a place where you offer a sacrifice of what is scarce. You're going to have to learn to give what costs you. What is it costing you to follow Jesus compared to what it costs Him so that you could follow Him? Did you hear me? What is it costing you to follow Jesus compared to what it cost Him so that you could follow Him. If it's not scarce, it doesn't count. And the reason why I say that is because God gave His only Son. He didn't have another Son as backup. He gave His everything. Are we doing the same so number one, scarce equals sacrifice. Number two, sacrifice separates the real from the fake. Show me someone who's willing to sacrifice something to follow Jesus, and I will show you a genuine, true believer. Too many are claiming to be a follower, but haven't even left anything at all behind. If you're a true believer, there will be litter on the ground behind you. Here's what I mean. There will be relationships, ambitions, prejudices, habits, and a multitude of other things that mark where you have come from. There will be things behind you. There will be evidence of things that you have left behind. You can mourn if you want about it, but you should actually rejoice. Because those lost items are a badge of authenticity. A badge that it is real, that it is, it is genuine, that it is legitimate. If you've given up a job, a habit, a preference, a dream to follow Jesus, then you are legitimate. To follow Christ, some of you have given up friends. You've walked away from a particular lifestyle. Some have even maybe cut ties with a job. Some of us have given up a lot to follow him. You know, many times you hear me talk about the fact that the one thing that truly earmarks a person being a believer in Jesus Christ or follow Jesus Christ is the love that we show. You know, that how we love others as he loves us. But another trademark, another characteristic of a believer is a believer who lives a life that is sacrificed. Who's willing to give things up. Who's willing to let things lay aside when they realize it's not about them. But it's about him willing to let go of things. Things of value to give to him to be used for his glory. Every disciple was marked by sacrifice. Where is the mark of sacrifice in your life? And I have this statement here. I said, I see, I see some getting fat and happy spiritually. But what I really want to see is I'm going to begin to see stretch marks of sacrifice. Sacrifice will stretch you. It will cause you to grow. It will test your faith. It will grow your faith. You should try to be laying aside something this week for the things you do. That's one thing I was, you know, one I were talking about this the other day. Growing up, I remember many times hearing my father preach messages and a lot of those messages were used. I talked to you, you know, people today seem like they want, they think they can get to a certain place in Christ and everything's good. In other words, I've reached a certain pinnacle, I've reached a certain plateau, and I'm just going to hang here because I, I, I've, I've learned enough about the Bible that I need to know. I've gotten close enough to Jesus, as close as I want to get. Things are going pretty good, and, and, and I'll just stay here. But in this walk with Jesus Christ, it's always about taking the next step. It's always, if you look at it as a ladder, it's always about going wrong, one step on the wrong on the ladder higher, but one rung more and keep on going up. We're never to get to a place where we become stagnant and stop, because then if we do, we find ourselves in trouble. We get to a place where we're never, where we don't want to learn anymore about who he is, where we don't want to 
deep in our relationship with the Lord, we find ourselves in trouble. But all of a sudden, when we don't really want to get into His Word the way we should, because we're like, okay, we're good where we are, and I just want to stay here. Because we begin to realize the deeper we go with Him, the more, the more sacrifice there is. We're like, well, I don't know if I'm ready to go that route. I'm here to tell you, you're, you're putting yourself in danger. Sacrifice separates the real from the fake. And I think a sacrifice is something we're going to do all the time while we are alive on this earth. So number one, scarce equals sacrifice. Number two, sacrifice separates the real from the fake. And then number three, sacrifice corrects perspective. See, Elijah's sacrifice changed the people's attention back to God. Our sacrifice makes us realize that stuff, things, they're not God. When we live a sacrifice life, it forces us to count on and to trust God. So I want you to stop and think about this for a moment. Elijah had to come to a place where he trusted God. I shared earlier, remember he announced about the drought coming. What does God tell him to do? Go to a certain place, just stay by this brook, and I will meet your needs. Now, let, you know, we hear that, but let's put ourselves in, 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 his, in his place. Imagine God told you to do something, it seems like he's telling you really off the wall, go here, just stay there, and I'm going to send animals to supply your need. There he's going to send ravens, they're going to bring you food. So he had to trust that God would do that. He had to trust that when he got to Mount Carmel, and he did all the stuff that God told him to do, that when he declared that rain is now going to come, that God will literally answer up. When he gave this stuff, this liquid gold, and he poured it out, you know, this amount of, you know, uh, the amount of water was 12 pitchers full, 12, 12 buckets full. You know, it could have, it could have gave, put some thirst for that day. It could have met the need of some people for that day. But yet he took and he poured it out upon an altar before the Lord. He had to trust that God was going to meet his prayer, that he's going to answer his prayer, that God was going to meet the need. But well, what if God hadn't an answered? See, and that's where we many of us find ourselves. We were at a place where, for some reason, we're afraid of sacrificing because we wonder if God will come through. And that's a part of the sacrifice. Sacrifice demands trust. Sacrifice demands trust. Our sacrifice will break the chains of dependency on other things and get us to adjust our perspective to what matters. Plus, it will also change others' perspectives so they see God too. See, we need to get to a place where people see the miraculous hand of God working in our lives. Sacrifice corrects perspective. And the last thing we'll talk to you about this morning is number four. Sacrifice unlocks supply. In Elijah's case, it unlocked rain. Notice what he sacrificed opened the door, opened the door to more of what he sacrificed. He sacrificed what was most scarce in the land at the time. What was most scarce? Water. And he made it part of the sacrifice. But I didn't tell you the end of the story that's in that chapter. If you read chapter 18, you'll find out that after he does this, and God's declared a torch, God answered by fire, and he, te he tells Ahab, to, Ahab, get ready. God said he'd bring abundance of rain. But the problem was, there were no rain clouds anywhere. They could look out, you know, he'd go on top of a mountain. They could look out, they, they could look out to the they could look out to the Mediterranean, and there was nothing out there. And Elijah begins to pray. And he sends a servant out there and he says, tell me, do you see anything? He says, nope, don't see anything. And the Bible says seven times he sent the servant back. And on the seventh time, the servant comes back and he says, there's a little dark cloud out there about the size of a man's hand. About the size of a man's hand. And he tells the servant, he says, go tell Ahab to get back to the palace. If he doesn't get back, he doesn't get back, the rain will stop him from getting there. And sure enough, 
the, the Bible says that an abundance amount of rain came and the drought was over. See, when we sacrifice what is scarce, when we truly get a place where we sacrifice this, it will unlock. What we sacrifice can unlock what we need. Like I said, Elijah, he sacrificed water and it unlocked rain. So here's the thing. If money is scarce, sacrifice money. If time is scarce, sacrifice time. When we sacrifice, it unlocks the supernatural power of God in our lives. Remember, as I was sharing the story, this is one portion of Scripture I want to share with you. In chapter 17, we read of a widow who God, who God told Elijah, he says, I have prepared a widow for you to take care of you during the remainder of this drought. During the remainder of this famine, I have prepared a widow for you. Now again, I want you to understand, and we're going to read this here, but I'm going to say this. What, her, what did her sacrifice produce? When it was all said and done, her sacrifice produced oil and flour that lasted until the end of the drought. That's what was the result. But let, me, let me read this to you. I, this, this is an amazing story. I love how it says this. 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 8 through 16. Here's what it says. It says, Then the Lord said to Elijah, Go and live in the village of Zarephath, near the city of Sidon. I have instructed a widow there to feed you. Now, now listen, listen to what God says. You just heard what God said, right? God says, I have instructed a widow there to feed you. So he went to Zarephath, and as he arrived at the gates of the village, he saw a widow gathering sticks, and he, and he, he asked her, would you please give me a little cup of water? And as she was going to get it, he called to her, bring me a bite of bread too. So again, why is Elijah doing this? Because what did God tell him? What did God say here? He says what? I have instructed a widow there to feed you. <laughs> I love God and really sort of like even his sense of humor. Because he says, I, I have... I have instructed a widow there to feed you. So Elijah, he's hearing this. He says, okay. He says, hey, well, you know, will you bring me some water? And as you're coming, bring me back some, some bread to eat too. So Elijah, he's just simply obeying what the Lord told him, right? This is a widow there. He's getting there. He's hungry. So he asks this widow for some bread. Now let's look further into this conversation here. But she said, I swear by the Lord your God that I don't have a single piece of bread in the house. Now, 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 wait a second. Didn't God just tell her, tell Elijah that I have instructed a widow to take care of you? And now here's the widow's reply. She says, I swear by the Lord your God that I don't have a single piece of bread in the house. I have only a handful of flour left in the jar and a little cooking oil on the bottom, in, in the bottom of the jug. I was just gathering a few sticks to cook this last meal. Then my son and I will die. But Elijah said to her, Don't be afraid. Go ahead and do what you have just said. But make a little piece of bread for me first. If you're in your Bible, you may want to sort of underlight that. Highlight, give a highlight. Mark it. Circle that. And then circle the next word. Then use what is left to prepare a meal for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. There will always be flour and olive oil left in your containers until the time when the Lord sends rains and crops to grow again. I'll stop this. Now, again, just put yourself in this lady's place. Just, 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 in, just in the garment, just in the flesh. This woman, the story is just really this. She's going to fix their last meal. She's going to take the little bit of flour she has left. And, and, and a little bit of oil she's going to use to, to fix them their last final meal. In other words, that's all the nourishment they have to sow. So when they eat this, that, that'll be it. And here comes this guy. He doesn't ask for all of it. He just says, give me what you have. Give me, what, give me the first of what you make. Give me, first do this for me, and then you can have the leftover. Like I said, this is her last meal. Sounds a little selfish, doesn't it? 
is sort of putting this woman in, in, in an awkward situation. See, because this little bit of bread that she could, that she could get that she gave Elijah could allow them to live maybe a little bit longer because it's a little bit more bread. And now all of a sudden he's not, he's trying to ask for something that they need to sustain their life a little bit longer. And from the human from the human standpoint, it makes no sense. Like I said, all the while, God says, I have instructed her to take care of me. But he tells her, he says, don't be afraid. Just go ahead and do what you said, but first, but bring the bread first. He says, then, the message we were listening to this morning, before we came in, I was talking about this, that sort of, sort of ties in. Uh, and as we, we'll, we'll, we'll be maybe something on this week later on this year, but talking about you get the first. The first fruits. You get them the first. Others honoring me. I was a kind of lawyer, but I'm saying that. Um, in God's program of taking care of things, the way He has things set up, when you speak to the children of Israel, He told them, He says, when, you're, when your animals give birth to an offspring, Whatever comes out first is mine. You give me what first come out, and you can keep the rest. Now, it didn't mean that they were to wait until ten lambs were born and they gave one lamb. They were to give the very first lamb that came out and trust God to give the other nine. See, many of us will get tied where we get tied out of our leftover. We give God out of our leftover instead of giving to him out of the first. The reason why this widow and everything was made is because she gave it out of the first. See, she didn't make sure her son and her were taken care of first. She took care of the man of God first. And then God also took left and all of a sudden we're going to read what happens. But we already know what God's, God's promise was. And here's what it says in verses 15 and 16. It says, So she did as Elijah said. And she and Elijah and her family continued to eat for many days. There was always enough flour and olive oil left in containers just as the Lord promised through Elijah. See, she offered what was scarce. And when she offered what was scarce, God supplied it all the rest of the time. See, we have to get our minds from this human part out of it and just truly look to the supernatural and understand that God is God. And as we sang this one of our songs this morning, through you I can do anything. Because there is nothing impossible for Him. But until we get to a place where we truly understand what is being taught in the Scripture, you will struggle in God providing for your life if you don't realize that He's first. And you give to him first. See, some of us do not experience supernatural happenings in our lives because we have locked the door by our lack of sacrifice. Your sacrifice may very well be the key to opening the door to your supply. It all goes back to that crazy little thing where about sowing and reaping. That, that, that law that, that God declares in His Word. But also, it will unlock strength. I'm not sure how this works. But something about sacrificing strengthens us. When we follow until it hurts, God steps in and puts His hand under us and lifts us up. See, a sacrifice life doesn't make us weaker. It makes us stronger. A sacrifice life is a strong life. When you sacrifice, you find that you are refreshed, renewed, and re-energized. And that's our musicians that come. And what I'm talking about this morning, I know, again, I know it's not easy. It's not an easy big concept to truly grab a hold of because to the human mind 
to natural understanding, it absolutely, utterly makes no sense. Well, from the natural mind, just think about it. We serve a God and believe in a God. We know there's a God who simply spoke and things were created. He literally spoke the stars into existence. Everything we see, He spoke into existence. And then the other stuff that was there, He took us and He took His own hand and formed us. When we truly get to a place where we realize how wonderful and how awesome and how mighty God is and just how vast and big He is. And we just learn to trust Him. God will be able to do some supernatural things in our life. And again, I know in general I'm preaching to the choir here this morning. But again, it does take us back to some of the thoughts we talked about, even those who have been serving God a lot. I'm going to ask you these couple of questions. Are you living a sacrifice life? Are you offering to God what is scarce to you? Or are you giving to him out of your abundance? Again, I'm glad he makes us abundant where we can give that way. But there are certain areas of our life, some we're trying to hold on to, that really, if we give it up to him, it will explode in our life if we truly give it to him. Are you living a sacrifice life? What has following Jesus cost you lately? I'm not talking about 20 years ago, 30 years ago, a year ago. What has following Jesus cost you lately? What is littering the ground behind you? Where is the evidence of you setting stuff aside of sacrificing things for Him? Because if it doesn't cost, it doesn't count. Especially when we're talking about living the blessed life. And again, understanding when I'm talking about being a blessed life, I'm not talking about God blessing you. She's going to say, okay, whew, I'm here now where God can bless me. So I'm just going to be blessed. Man, this is good. God, just keep the blessings coming. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. He didn't bless you. That's not the reason for being blessed. We're blessed to be a blessing. Because that's what he told Abraham. And he's the father of faith. And we're children of Abraham. We're children of faith. He says, through you, all the nations of the world will be blessed. So if he said that to our father of faith, what do you think he's saying to us? Through us people are to be blessed. We're blessed to what? To be a blessing. We're not blessed to sit down and take our ease and say, oh God, keep it coming. We're blessed to be a blessing. We're blessed to go impact somebody else for Him. But the sacrifice life thing, I mean, that, that's, you want to unlock some things, it's found here. Truly making sure you put God first, you give to Him first. Not leftover, but first. We'll get into that maybe sometime later on this year. And again, then now you're probably afraid to raise your hands. But who truly wants to live blessed, live a blessed life. And we want to be blessed, why? So we can be a blessing. If that's your desire. Again, I'm not telling this, you know, I'm trying to help you. 
and help you truly walk into the truth and walk into what God has for us. But we have to do it the way He has set it up or else it doesn't work. So we stand with this one. And I want us to sing this song called Who Can Satisfy? And as we sing, I want you to understand. The song says it tells us, who can satisfy <laughs> like you or who can, who can, who can you know, there, there's absolutely no one out there who can do what you do. And when we really think about this, then, then why are we so many times so hesitant of just truly giving things to him? Of getting what is scarce. Whatever it is. Why are we sometimes just so afraid to trust Him and let Him honor His work? He can be trusted. And sometimes you will never know that or truly fully understand it. So you step out in faith and truly sacrifice the way He says. I know that can be different for each one of us here and I'm sure it is. But again, are you living a sacrificed life? What has followed Jesus cost you lately? What is littering the ground behind you? This is a time for some self-reflection this morning. Because this message today isn't for the lost person because they don't understand this. These concepts definitely go over your head. Way over. But if you're a believer in Jesus Christ's place this morning, this message is for you. And I believe he wants, you, he wants to truly let freedom come to your life. And he wants blessing to come to your life. But you need to understand, you've got to be willing to sacrifice. Not think you're sacrificing. Not putting on a show that you're sacrificing. But truly sacrificing. And by thinking about that, I want to encourage you with what this song says. But there's absolutely no one like that. As we sing this song, if you feel the Holy Spirit moving upon your heart, and just want to come and spend some time with this offer, go to this morning. And just reach and say, Lord, I made these steps in the past, and I swear maybe I've got a little laugh. But maybe not. I mean, maybe you're where you need to be. You just want to pray. But maybe, maybe you do need to say, Lord, I need to say, I need to refresh some things. I need to really get to a place where I'm willing, willing to just really lay some things aside. I'm willing to give you some things that maybe I was wanting to really give you the things that I value. And give it to you and trust you with them. That you as we sing this song this morning, you slip out and come and spend some time here this morning and just talk with them. Amen. Yeah.